Last week, this video of the Speaker of the House went viral. I would come to him and punch him out. This is oh, my mom. I've been waiting for this, for trespassing on the Capitol grounds. I'm going to punch him out and I'm going to go to jail and I'm going to be happy. That was Nancy Pelosi on January the 6th in footage filmed by her daughter, pledging to give Trump a piece of her mind and maybe her fist, too. Liberals loved it. This was Pelosi at her Trump bashing best. But when that new video came out last week, Politico's Rachel Bade tweeted this. Nancy Pelosi said she wanted to punch Donald Trump in those January 6th videos. But as we scoop in our new book, she actually pulled her punches against the former president over and over and over again. That new book from Bade and fellow congressional reporter Karen Demergen of The Washington Post is Unchecked, the untold story behind Congress's botched impeachments of Donald Trump. And through 700 pages based on more than 250 interviews, they paint a bleak picture of Democratic leaders bungling the historic impeachment of a lawless president twice. Among the book's revelations, even after the release of Robert Mueller's report on Russian interference in the 2016 election, even after a whistleblower revealed Trump's pressure campaign against Ukraine, Nancy Pelosi tried for months to stop Trump's impeachment from happening, for fear it would hurt swing district Democrats at the next election. Even when Pelosi relented, she still limited the inquiry only to Trump's Ukraine pressure campaign, refused to add Trump's emoluments violations, his Stormy Daniels payments, or Mueller's allegations that the president had tried to obstruct justice. And then, even in the narrow Ukraine inquiry, Pelosi called for it to be over fast, cutting investigative corners in the process and skipping subpoenas for testimony from witnesses like former Trump national security advisor John Bolton. All of that, the authors say, gave Republicans the leeway they needed to let Trump off with impunity, leading, of course, to January the 6th and another bungled impeachment. It's maddening. All the more so if, like me, you were one of those people warning back then that Democrats, their leaders, Speaker Pelosi, were dropping the ball, were failing to hold Trump to account, were dragging their feet on impeachment and letting Trump get away with one misdeed after another. Three years later, unchecked is sadly a vindication for the Pelosi critics. The book also reveals the extent to which key Republican leaders knew Donald Trump was a walking hot mess of high crimes and misdemeanors and feared some of their own members might have voted to impeach in the House or convict in the Senate if only Democrats had waged a thorough House investigation and impeachment inquiry. A spokesman for Pelosi has called the book a futile exercise of whataboutism that ignores the stranglehold Trump had and continues to have on the Republican Party. But now, as the January 6th committee pursues a subpoena against former President Donald Trump and hundreds of pro-Trump election deniers are vying for office in November, the threat to democracy is alive and well, and Democrats are asking voters to trust them to turn back the threat. Unchecked, forces readers to ask an uncomfortable question. Did Democrats already miss their chance? As constitutional law professor Steve Vladek told the authors, quote, we can't know what would have happened if the Democrats had been more aggressive from the get-go, but it's hard to imagine we'd be in a worse place. Joining me now, the co-authors of Unchecked, Karen Demergen and Rachel Bade, who were both on Capitol Hill for The Washington Post during the Trump years, Karen is now Pentagon correspondent for The Post, and Rachel is a co-author of Politico Playbook. Thank you both for joining me. Congratulations on the book. Rachel, let me start with you. There is a common argument from Democrats that it wouldn't have mattered what they did in any impeachment proceeding. You never would have gotten enough Senate Republicans, 17, to convict. Uh, but your book complicates that narrative. What did you find, especially when it comes to the second impeachment, which Nancy Pelosi could have started on the morning of January the 7th, when everyone was furious, including Republicans, but didn't? I mean, this notion that Democrats argue that nothing would have changed no matter what they did, uh, that's a sellout. And our book shows that in great detail. I mean, we have reporting about Jamie Herrera Butler, who is a moderate Republican uh, from Washington, Washington State. She became a key figure in the second impeachment, as you'll remember. Uh, during the first impeachment, she and other moderate Republicans had serious problems with what Trump was doing in terms of the quid pro quo with Ukraine. She even stood up in a leadership meeting, we report, uh, and, and pressed her Republican leaders, why shouldn't I vote for an impeachment inquiry? And the way they got her back on board uh, was to point to a lot of procedural issues Democrats were having. Um, they were 
changing precedent from what we saw even in Clinton uh, and Nixon as well, and basically arguing that, look, they're not giving due process to the president, they're uh, not letting you see certain documents, et cetera, and use that to sort of whip her against the, the whole inquiry. Same thing happened with Francis Rooney, uh, a conservative from Florida. He actually approached Pelosi and said he would vote to impeach Trump if she would call in firsthand witnesses like John Bolton and take the yeah. time to for fight for their testimony in court. But he, uh, she said no. She wanted to get the impeachment over with and lost just there in the first impeachment two opportunities. Yeah, Democrats are always in a rush in both impeachments. I remember Chris Coons wanted to go home for Valentine's Day. Uh, current Republicans don't come off well in your book either, especially Jim Jordan of Ohio, the top Republican on the House Judiciary Committee, whom you report used some, I don't know, dirty tricks and may have attempted to even obstruct justice. What happened there? Well, look, we document how Jim Jordan basically was trying to convince the Republic, trying to convince the White House to actually play ball with the investigation at the same time that he was defending the White House's decision to block Congress, to obstruct Congress from being able to do its job in public. So this shows in real time how there was a very conscious effort that the Republicans knew that they, the line they were de delivering to the public was very hypocritical and was not actually good for Congress or good for the country, as they were doing Trump's bidding anyway. And following these pledges, as they, it, it's not just Jim Jordan. We document that happening with Kevin McCarthy through the second impeachment as well. We document that happening with Mitch McConnell, who, as we all know, stood up after the, the, the second acquittal vote and said, there's no question in my mind that Trump is responsible for this. Oh, but there's a procedural problem. We show backroom meetings where he told people, including his own staff, this feels like an off-ramp. It feels like an excuse. It's just a way to get out of a difficult situation, but did it anyway. And so that kind yes. of shows that there were these moments where the, well, it, we also document these moments where the GOP was not thinking with such calculation, where on January 6th, Mitch McConnell was approaching the Democrats in their lockdown and saying, we have to work together. We're done with Trump. There's no way he can help us. And that's, you were referring to the opportunity to impeach Trump the second time on January 6th itself, or at least the next morning, uh, had Pelosi just gone with that. That's one of those moments where where, you know, you don't give the GOP time to think about their their political calculations because when they start to think yeah. about them, they start to act in a kind of two faced way. But we show how well put. all of the principals there basically had this not doing, not saying what they actually thought, and the the two sides of that happening at the same time. So, Rachel, in your introduction, you have a remarkable sentence, quote, when asked about our reporting, some senior Democratic sources threatened to cut off cooperation with us. And in the case of Pelosi's office, chose to disengage from the book entirely after learning that our discoveries challenged the speaker's preferred narrative. I mean, we're used to hearing about Trump and Republicans shutting out the media, threatening them, throwing tantrums. But this book seems to have really struck a nerve with Democratic leadership. They seem acutely aware of and sensitive about their failures in those impeachments, do they not? Look, they like the preferred narrative out there surrounding these impeachments, and that's that they did everything they could to show the, the country that Trump was dangerous. But the reality is they didn't. I mean, Pelosi, as you said in your intro, uh, put the first impeachment on a timeline. She ignored a lot of investigative threads that other Democrats, including Jamie Raskin, who was sort of a hero in the second impeachment for the Democratic Party, uh, what his advice was, which was to broaden and sort of go after corruption. I want to go back to your first question, though, because you were asking about uh, sort of these missed opportunities, and particularly you are interested in the second impeachment. Even after January 6th, Pelosi shut down an effort to impeach Trump that very night, we report in our book. Even though she said she wanted to punch him in the face, she, as Karin likes to say, uh, pulled her constitutional punches that night. And there was pressure from Chuck Schumer, uh, from uh, the White House, on Jamie Raskin's team to move on in the yeah. second impeachment and, and to just sort of throw the cards, throw in his cards, hold his cards. Um, and that sort of, what would have happened, yeah. you have to think, if they had used that moment to really call subpoenas and chase things down, could they have convicted Trump? Look, look, nobody likes to question their heroes. And this is part of the problem, because, you know, the, the people who back the intent that Democrats had in going after Trump these two times do not want to look and say, well, did they make mistakes? Was it flawed? Because it's difficult to, to do that. It requires self-examination. And it's easier to just yeah. blame the other side for being at fault. But our reporting shows that there, there were these moments. And look, it's, it's not even just our reporting. The January 6th committee that has just wrapped, uh, wrapped up its hearings, they are covering the same ground of subject matter as impeachment, too. Yeah. But look at how differently they're doing it. They're going after their subpoena is fighting them in court. They are pulling in Republican witnesses. They are doing everything that they didn't do the first Indeed. time. And here we are. See, except for the fact, the one big difference, though, is that 
that they have a friendly president right now and a friendly administration <laughs> helping them out. It's not actually it's not actually a complete course correction because we don't know if congressional oversight is going to hold up the next time against a president who would rather squish it out. We we also don't know what the coming impeachment of a Republican House are going to look like.